Hello, it's The Rock Podcast, and I'm Denny Somak. I'm a rock historian, producer, and best-selling author. I've been talking to lots of people and collecting thousands of interviews over the years. There are great stories from my archives, and we also do newly recorded conversations. That's what we have on this episode. But this is exciting for me because I have Eric Bazilian with me, and I've known him for over 40 years. His band is The Hooters, a group he founded with Rob Hyman. They started out in Philadelphia when the two of them met as students at the University of Pennsylvania. Eric sings and plays guitar, mandolin, recorder, harmonica, and saxophone. Their sound is very unique as it combines rock, reggae, ska, folk, a little bit of everything. Now, they first gained success in the U.S. in the mid-1980s when they got a lot of radio airplay and were in heavy rotation on MTV. Their songs include All You Zombies, Day by Day, And We Danced, and Johnny B, among others. And they have a unique distinction of playing three of some of the biggest concert events in history, including being the opening band at the Live Aid concert in Philadelphia in 1985. They are very popular in Europe, particularly in Germany, where they uh, played at the Wall concert in Berlin in 1990. Eric and Rob Hyman are also the backing band on Cyndi Lauper's classic debut album, She's So Unusual. Eric maintains a solo career as well and wrote One of Us, a song first recorded and a hit by Joan Osborne in 1995. In May of 2023, the Hooters released a new album called Rocking and Swing. It's their first studio recording since 2010. One final thing. I produced a weekly TV show on the USA Network in the early 1980s called Hotspots. It was an in-concert show, and I booked the Hooters on an episode. This is before they had a record deal. In fact, I was going through my archives and found the show, so I have a short clip which I want to share with you. But first, the Rock Podcast is sponsored by AuthenticRockCollectibles.com. It's the place to see and buy really cool items, including rare records, rock art, CDs, books, and more. That's AuthenticRockCollectibles.com. Now, let's go to Eric Bazilian and talk Hooters and more. Danny, hiya. I'm good. How are you? Can't complain. Good. Got a lot of stuff to talk about. I know you got a lot of stuff going on. Oh, man. You have no idea. Yeah, well, that's what we're going to talk about. This is called, our show is called The Rock Podcast. We're the number one podcast for classic rock. We just started our third season. Had nice. John, but we haven't had you. However, that's right. Bob Left Sets is a friend of mine, and I heard you did his first podcast. Very good. Yep. So, yep. Yep. I've, anyway. I've known Bob. I've known Bob, I think, since the late 70s. Yeah. When he started doing his sheet and sent it out in the mail. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Great guy. Nice shirt, by the way. Nice oh. shirt. Yeah. I figured this would be appropriate. Not too many yeah. people would know what this is, but you do. Yeah. So let's get right into it. Um, you got. So many things happening. Let's start with first of all, you're you're doing your first tour in what nineteen years? It's our first U.S. tour in thirty years. Thirty years. Okay. <clears throat> thirty years. Three zero. Yeah. yeah. I mean, aside from you know, we played we played the Philadelphia area right just about every year, and then we've done some shows at 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 uh, Disney World and right you know scattered things. But our first proper, we're getting on the bus and going tour since nineteen ninety three. And what's this tour called? Because you're on with Rick Springfield and uh, Paul Young. and Yeah, I think it's called I Want My 80s. Oh, okay. Flashback to the MTV years, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I think I think that 
I think that Sirius XM has something to do with it. You know, they've got Mark right. and all the, uh, the VJs. Right. How important was MTV to your, your career in the beginning? You know, I've only realized recently how important it, it really was. I think it's probably the single most important factor right. in launching us, at least in the United States, because we never had a top 10 single, radio right. single. Right. Um, our, our biggest song, and we danced, I don't think even cracked the top 20. I think that peaked at 21. Yeah. So, so you know, we were we were MTV stars, but not really so much radio stars. Right, right. Okay, so you have a new album coming out, Rocking and Swing, correct? That's correct. Okay, so, uh, and you also are re-releasing your first album, which, of course, I remember being a DJ in Philly, because I've known you since mm -hmm. the beginning of time, playing it and seeing you at all those early shows. Sure. Do you remember I put you on my show, Hot Spots? Yep, of course. <laughs> okay, so I was a big was... fan. Just, you know, I'll be a fanboy for a minute. Uh, have watched you, though, from the beginning. Very excited for your success. Thank you for the Golden Platinum album I got, all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> I haven't talked to you in a while, but anyway. So tell me about the new album. What's uh, When did you start working on it? Um, so Rob and I, you know, it's always something that's in the back of our minds, you know, a new record, but it's a lot of work that goes into it. Right. <clears throat> um, not the least of which is writing a new song and finding a song that that um, uh, finding a song that, that creates its own category right. in our in our set because anything that we release we want to be able to play live. So if we write another rock song, is it as good as and we danced? Is it as good as Day by Day? Right. Um, you know, we write another deep reggae groove. Is it as good as All You Zombies and so on and so forth? Um, but the, the one thing that we haven't done is gone back to our ska and reggae roots and right. really, really, you know, commit to that. Right. for an album and this started over a year ago when we we wrote a song we just got lucky and wrote a new song and it happened to be a ska with with saxophone and and you know all the all of the ingredients and it didn't feel like it was um it didn't feel like it was going back it really felt like we were like we were moving forward with it right so, so that was the you know that was the beginning Right, and right. then we just figured we'd uh, we'd go down that road and see how far we could get. And we found a couple of um, a couple of uh, songs that we'd released on on earlier albums that maybe we hadn't gotten the arrangement quite right the first time, and some of the lyrics. So we we regified and scoffied a couple of them. Right. Okay. Uh, did you guys, you and Rob, we're talking about Rob Hyman, your songwriting partner for many years, and your partner in the band when you started in 1980 around then. Uh, did you guys write all the songs? Yeah, we did. Um, uh, Rick Chertoff uh, contributed to a couple of them, a couple of the older ones. But yeah, um, we did. Very essentially, there's one that, one that I wrote in my head during the last game of the Phillies, um, the Phillies uh, playoff game in 1980 that got them into the World Series. Right. Uh, it's called Pete Rose. Yeah, I, I saw that. Remember it. It's like an instrumental. It's an instrumental. Yeah. Well, you, you know, it, it was a big thing in the old ska tradition. They would have a, a, an instrumental that would just have a name, like James Bond, and then, you know, ska, and then somewhere in the middle, right. the guy goes, James Bond, or One Step Beyond. So this was Pete Rose. It just rolls off the tongue. <laughs> okay, so, so yeah, the people, album... I'm sure we're... The album is I'm out. Sure we're going to get some... Yeah. yeah the, album, the album will be out Friday. It will be on... Um, it will hit the, uh, the, the DSPs on Friday. Okay, and you're also re-releasing your first album and your first single on vinyl. Well, the first album has been out. Uh, Amore, Amore, we still have, we're still selling old vinyl copies of that from back right. in the day. Right. Uh, we put that up on Spotify. Uh, um, uh, and we put out that CD in two thousand one or two thousand two, right. I think. Yeah. Um, but we are re-releasing our very first single um, on yellow vinyl. It's. Uh, it, we have still have not put it up on the DSPs. We will eventually, but we want to make it sort of an, an exclusive, like the old days. You had to get the sure. record if you wanted to hear it. Sure. Now, uh, for those that don't know, your first album, which you released on your own label, uh, sold about 100,000 copies when it came out, which is phenomenal. It must have blown you away. It's pretty unheard of. I know. You know, you know we, we had no... We had no concept of what, what was going to happen with that. And, uh, you know, real, really now a national act puts out an album. 
they sell 150,000 copies. That's a huge success. Right. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So uh, of the albums you've released, uh, Nervous Night and, uh, and, you know, the songs Day by Day and All You Zombies and any comments about any of those now? How many of those will be in this show? Actually, tell me what will be in, in this show. We typically do all the hits. Um, right. You know, it's a, it's a little, um, it gets a little complicated sometimes because we have different hits in different countries. Yeah. You know, so like in Germany, Johnny B is the song that everyone knows. Literally everyone in Germany knows that song. I don't right. know how. All ages. Um you know, it's gotten us through some gnarly border crossings. Um, but um, sometimes, but sometimes here, if we're playing a short, a short, shorter show, we won't even do that song. Right. You know, and likewise, and we danced, which was, you know, undeniably our biggest hit here. Never really happened in in Europe. Um, but we, yeah, we, we, everyone, everyone will be satisfied. A splendid time is guaranteed for all. What do you attribute the success in Germany and other parts of Europe? Well, Germany in general seems to be a really faithful public. I think once you have an audience there, you, you always have them. Um, I, somehow I think they really appreciated the, the what they call the handmade aspect of our music. Right. Uh, as time, especially, you know, as time went on, as we got more into the 90s um, and, and music became less and less organic, ours did not. Okay. And I, if I'm not mistaken, I think you have three volumes of greatest hits out in Germany. Yeah, yeah at least. People <laughs> keep putting them out. And it's like in, for, in Germany, anyone can put out anything as long as they pay you a royalty. Right. <laughs> so they put out a, there are live albums out there. I have no idea where they came from. Okay. Now, for those that don't know, uh, you backed an unknown singer named Cindy Lauper on her first album. How did that come about? Through Rick Chertoff, your producer? That was through Rick Chertoff, yes. He was uh, working for for uh, Columbia at the time, and Cindy was signed to Epic, which was a sister label under right. the uh, the Sony. So Rick got her, uh, and then he decided, rather than just bringing in studio musicians, to have me and Rob act as a band. So we just hunkered down in our little uh, our, our, our little rehearsal place in Maniunk with my four-track cassette player, <laughs> and uh, we demoed up her album. Now, are you playing on the entire album? Uh, yeah, yeah. I played every guitar part I, except for one, I believe. And I also played sax, and I played some bass. Okay. So um, those that know from the local area, Girls Just Want to Have Fun was written by a fellow Philadelphian, Robert Hazard. Had you heard it by him before you recorded it? I believe I must have, because I'd seen him live a bunch, and I'm, I'm pretty sure he was that song was a staple of his set. I don't think I had heard the recording, uh, but I, I heard the recording w when we were starting to 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 work with Cindy. She did not want to sing that song. That song okay. she had no love for. Girls just want to have fun. But then when we when we landed on the arrangement that we finally came up with she all of a sudden loved the song and always wanted to sing it so right so okay now also on that album is a song that uh i guess rob co-wrote with her time after time which has become a classic obviously anything yeah. you remember about the recording of that oh very much yeah that was the only song that we hadn't done a real uh, demo for um because rob and cindy wrote that towards the end of the recording process as so often happens you know what that one last song becomes the becomes the one um so i remember they they came to me and played me their first sketch of, of time after time it's a different lyrics and the verses but the, i that was the first time in my life i heard a song and i knew that i was going to be hearing it for the rest of my life right so your career has been pretty amazing um in the sense that you've been part of three of the biggest events of all time starting with Live Aid and Amnesty and, of course, uh, the Berlin Wall concert with uh, Roger Waters. Tell me about Live Aid. What was that like for you? The actual performance was, I barely remember it. it <laughs> literally, we were, we were gone before we got, we got there, practically. Now, is it, true remember, that, uh, is it true that Geldof didn't want you to be the opener? Well, you know, there is that uh, famous quote, you know, what, who the fuck are the Hooters? 
Right. He said, I probably would have said the same thing. I, I don't know that he didn't want us. I think he was just surprised to see a, a name like that appear on his precious festival. Right. Now, if I'm not mistaken, uh, several years later, when you were headlining in Germany, wasn't he your opening act somewhere? Yeah, and it was the week that the, that the DVD set came out and we were not included. Ah. Did you talk to him yes, about was, it? No, we didn't. He was very sheepish. He sort of avoided us. Ah. <laughs> so you got your comeuppance there. Okay. Uh, what can you tell me about playing the Amnesty show? Well, the Amnesty show was felt much more organized. You know, they'd had a lot more time to put it together. And, um, and um, we played a, you know, a full 45 minute set. Right. As opposed to running up at nine o'clock in the morning and, and running off. Um, but, you know, it was amazing. The police got back together there for the first time in, in years. Right. And, you know, you too, it was, yeah. I mean, it was like live aid without the steroids. Right. Okay. And uh, the Berlin Wall concert with Waters. That was insane. We were in Japan when he called. He called us at our hotel in Tokyo and asked if we'd come to Berlin. Uh, we flew home to Philadelphia for one day and then we got on a plane for, uh, for, for Berlin. And he, I, re I remember when we first walked in to the rehearsal studio in, in, in one of the hotels, right. Brian Adams was singing Young Lux. And Brian finished and Roger just started shaking his head and said, imagine what it must be like going through life, opening your mouth and having that come out. <laughs> what's uh, He's in the news lately. What's, what's Roger Waters like? Our experience with him was great. He was, he was funny. He was very, very gracious to us. Um, it's funny because during, during the, the show, everything that could have possibly gone wrong did. And right. he just, left okay now i've i've interviewed him a number of times and I, you know lately he's been in the press for saying some things that a lot of other musicians yeah. objected to i was speaking to ian anderson of jethro tull the other day and he went on a five minute rant you know but do you have any feelings about the, the statements that he's making especially the anti-semitic statements it's it's <laughs> You know, I don't want to. I don't want to judge him until I talk to him. Okay. Uh, he he does he does some pretty good justifications for for it. You know, he says he's not anti-Semitic. He's not anti-Semitic. Um, yeah, I don't know if he's anti-Semitic. I my I don't think he he is. Then again, you know, there are someone else who says he's the least racist person he knows, and well, we know about that. Right. Right. So yeah. so I you know I don't know. Again, I. I I don't know how much of it is what he truly believes or how much of it is just for, for uh, effect. Okay. What are some of the other uh, major festivals or events that you can recall? And I know you, you live part-time in Sweden. What about Scandinavia in Europe? Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, we played, we've played Sweden rock uh, twice, which is a huge festival. Right. People come from all over Northern Europe to that. You know, we played between Ozzy Osbourne and Black Label Society <laughs> on the same stage. We play a lot of hard rock festivals in Europe and they love us. Right. It's crazy. You know, the, the, when we pull out the accordions and the mandolins, they go nuts. Hmm. Okay. Uh, Sweden, by the way, is beautiful. I've been there twice. I love it. I'm going to try and go back uh, yeah. this year if I can. I just I think it's the greatest. Been to Norway, too. Love that, too. So how much time do you spend in Sweden and how much time do you spend in the Philadelphia area? I spend more time here than I do there. Um, you know, we, I did. I was there pretty much full time for, for a couple of years. Right. Well, for one year for the, during the, the, uh, the pandemic year, I, I was there, right. which actually worked out great because it was pretty much business as usual there. Yeah, it was a pretty safe place to be, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, it, you know, many people thought it was a dangerous place to be because it was, you know, there were no real restrictions. Right. Um, uh, there were recommendations. They, you know, say, yes, maybe you should wear a mask on at, at, during rush hour on the on public transit. Right. But um, I think when it all came, you know, came out in the wash, it was pretty much uh, pretty much the same numbers there as it was here. Now, I'm sure you've gotten to meet a lot of your idols over the years. I know you did Top of the Pops. You met McCartney. What was that like? 
it, it was it was beyond anything I could have imagined. Meeting Paul, meeting all three of the Beatles that I met. You right. know, Paul, we you know, we did uh, Top of the Pops with him, and I was debating whether I was going to like go to the trouble of standing in the line of admirers and and shake his hand and say, "Yeah, you're the reason I do what I do," and I decided, "What the hell?" So I, I you know I let all of the crew. The uh, the local TV crew get through, and then I walked up, stuck my hand out, said, "Hi, Paul. I'm Eric. From, oh, from the Hooters. Yeah, I recognize you from your video. Linda, call me Eric." <laughs> and the other guys came over, and you know, he knew our music. And where did, did you and meet then, George and Ringo too? Well, yeah. So um, a few months later, we were back in London, as fate would have it, doing another TV show, and. We heard that George was in the building somewhere doing doing one of the talk shows, and the rest of our band decided they were going to run, not take the elevator, run through the building and find George. Rob right. and I were too school for, too cool for school. Right. We decided to wait at the elevator, and all of a sudden we hear the voice from behind us, "Hey, I'm sure the hitters. I'm George. Love your music. Everything else these days is crap." <laughs> And Ringo? And by then the rest of the band. And well, so 2005, maybe, I was in, in LA writing some songs with Mark Hudson, the legendary right. Mark Hudson, sure. who was Ringo's producer and musical director at the time. And they, while, while we weren't writing songs, Mark and Ringo and the band were rehearsing for the upcoming tour. So one day Ringo asked Mark, so what are you doing when you leave here? And Mark said, you know, who who he was writing with. And Ringo said, apparently, you think he'd fancy having a write with me then? <laughs> and um, the next day, he, uh, Mark brought Ringo and Barbara Bach to the studio and he just, he just walked in and gave me a big hug and we just started talking like we were old friends. So you like just about everybody else, I think we're the same age, 52, 53, 19, when we were born. Yep. Saw the Beatles on Ed Sullivan. Yep. Was that it? That that did it for you? That was it. <laughs> that was it. I remember I think it was during I Wanna Hold Your Hand that I um made the commitment. Yeah. Okay. What was your first band called? The Limestones. Okay. Which was sort of a takeoff on the quarrymen. Okay, good. Yeah. All right. And then um I know Rob was in wax, but you you didn't have a band with him until after wax that was baby Greg. i was in the last i was in the last incarnation of wax okay oh you were okay when, when, and... yeah when rob and i met at penn there was a there was a version of wax that had two electric pianos two drummers a bass player and a singer but no guitar okay and uh baby grand yeah well we you know we did that we made two two I think great albums that were either ahead of their time or behind their time, but bring me your broken heart smash. <laughs> oh, yeah. Smash. Absolutely. To this day. Another yeah. Thing... Yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, the, you know, there, we learned a lot about dealing with disappointment. Yeah. Okay. I want to ask you something else. Cause I remember I was talking to Rob a few years ago about this and I know this guy pretty well. Cause I work with Dave Mason. And he was Dave's songwriting partner for a while. Jerry Lynn Williams as a songwriter. Oh, <laughs> yep. I, I knew Jerry Lynn through Dave, who had written some mm -hmm. songs. He was one of the most amazing, I think he's one of the most amazing American songwriters. Now, you know, obviously he's no longer around. <coughs> and he had a bit of a bit of a crazy side to him. But yeah, what was your, where did you meet him? What was the attraction? And did you end up writing songs with him? We did. We did. We met him. I think we met him through Skip Drinkwater. Okay. And, um, <laughs> excuse me. It's okay. Long COVID. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, we met, we met Jerry Lynn Williams through Skip Drinkwater and arranged to, to fly out to, uh, Tulsa and write some songs with him. And it was insane. <laughs> we had this great house on top of it, top of a hill with a landing strip. Uh huh. And, um, uh, the first thing he said, before we get to writing, uh, you guys are going to go into town. You're going to pick up. You're going to pick up uh, fixings for um, for uh, salsa, and you're going to buy a half a gallon of Myers rum. Right. Okay. <laughs> and so that set the tone for our writing sessions. Two two of the songs we wrote with him did end up on on one of our albums. Actually, 
he said, funny thing to us, he said, I got to tell you two things. I only write hit songs and I only write love songs. Right. Well, he's written a lot of hits, <laughs> that's for sure. He, he, boy, he really had that run in the, in the, uh, in the 90s. Yeah, 90s. He, did. he did. I'll ask you about your love for love. Because I, I haven't yes. seen any covers, but She Comes in Colors on the first album. When I first saw that, I said, I can't believe it. Because this is my favorite album of all time, Forever Changes. How did I get into love? You know, in 1966, I guess when their first album came out, right. there wasn't a lot to choose from. Right. You know, if you were into psychedelic progressive rock, and I remember just being at EJ Corvettes and seeing the uh, right. seeing that 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 first album, <clears throat> that album cover, and I'm like, wow, these guys look cool. Let's talk a little bit about your solo career. You have done a few solo albums. You also worked <laughs> with uh, Joan Osborne. How did that come about? That was a Rick Chertoff adventure. You know, Rick had um, had left Columbia and got his own label at Universal. <clears throat> and Joan was his first signing. And like Cindy, he decided to put a band together, basically, me and Rob. And, um, uh, you know, one night um, I came home from our session and uh, um, Sarah, my, my now wife, then new girlfriend, who had just moved over from Sweden, right. asked me to show her how my four track cassette recorder worked. And what came out was one of us. Interesting. You so you you remember the actual writing of the whole song and the inspiration. I remember it, I, it absolutely. I have a total sense memory of how I was sitting, of of what, uh, because I I literally freestyled the lyrics. I did not write <laughs> write them down. I literally put the put the machine into record and sang. Right. And I do remember feeling this. You know what some might call a possession or a some sort of woohoo absolute oneness with the universe moment. Right. <clears throat> Were you surprised at the reaction it got? Um, yeah, of course I was. You know, I wrote it, my demo, um, I sang like Brad Roberts from the Crash Test Dummies. That's how I heard it in my head. Okay. So it was, you know, it was not that beautiful, God had a name. It was, if God had a name. And when I brought it in the next day, to our session, you know, with Joan and, and Rick and Rob, I played the demo just thinking they would go, wow, that's a really weird, weird song. And it ended and Rick Chertoff just said, Joan, do you think you could sing that? And the rest is history. Yeah. Who else have you written songs for? Um, let's see, I wrote, I, I wrote um, Robbie Williams' first single with him and Desmond Child. Um, Ricky Martin, uh, we did it. Uh, the version of uh, Private Emotion, which was a Hooter song from the Out of Body album right. uh, on, on Ricky Martin's big album. Uh, Billy Myers, Kiss the Rain, written a bunch with the Scorpions. <clears throat> right. That was a blast. I love those guys. And, and, and you've had some of, some of your songs and the Hooter songs covered by other people. Have you heard most of them? I think I, think I have. Sometimes I'll go on a deep dive to you know really hear what's out there. There are some kind of funny amateur amateur covers of some yeah. of the songs and some of them are amazing. I'll tell you a story you may not know because I did some work briefly with the Red Rockers. Mm -hmm. And I, I, sure. I, I said to them, I said, <clears throat> on your album, you covered this Hooters song. How the hell do you know who the Hooters are? The guy says to me, oh, we saw them on Hot Spots. We loved the song. Wow. So unbelievable. <laughs> I, I bet the band doesn't know that. He goes, oh, no, we were all sitting on the couch watching USA, and we tune in, and all of a sudden, there's the hood, and they play this song, and we all go, we should do that song. Wow. <laughs> that's amazing. No, I've never heard that. Okay, well, I, you know, like I said, that's true. What, uh, is it a, a tough decision, or what makes you decide what's going to be a solo song and what's going to be a song for the Hooters? <clears throat> it's funny because that's that's a real thing that's a discussion that rob and i have an ongoing thing we never got to the lennon mccartney thing where where you know john brought in songs paul brought in songs our thing has always been hooter songs for the most part are songs that we write toe to toe head to head from beginning to end there have been a few exceptions 
but usually, uh, you know, I bring songs in, play them for Rob, and he's like, that's a great Eric song. <laughs> and a few times I'd sort of push the issue and say, yeah, but it, it, it would be a great Hooters song. And we learn it with the band and we play it. And then I'm usually the one, the first one to go, you know what? This is not a Hooters song. This is an Eric song. Right. Hooters songs tend to have a bigger, you know, a less personal perspective. You know, our songs tend to be we rather than I, <clears throat> which I think people like. I think that's part of the, the charm, the appeal of the band, especially live. We're a big village. Now, I, I know you do this when you play the stage, especially around Philly. You, you usually go out, say hi to the fans and everything. What's it like when you're in, in Europe? Do, the, do you have one-on-one -on -one with the fans? Or? Um, we don't get recognized that much. Um, and when we do, it's in like the most un, unexpected situations. Um, it's, uh, like in, in Germany, our music is better known than, than we are. For a while, when we would tour, the posters would have the, the names of our songs bigger than the name of the band. <laughs> so, you know, I can basically walk up to any German and, and start singing Johnny B, and they'll go, oh, this is a wonderful song. Do you know who made this song? Yes, I made. we made that song. Oh, I love your band. You're a great band. Do you speak German? I'm getting there. I've been working on it. Um, I speak Swedish. Swedish. I figured that. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm 90% fluent in Swedish. German, German's another, another level because you've got the grammar thing, yeah. and the and the genders. But but um, you know, I'm on day 860 something on on Duolingo. <laughs> okay. And I sing in German. We do um, a few of our songs have been have been translated in German. We have one song that we wrote in German, right, which was totally totally being possessed. And then um, um, I do one of us in German. A German band did a great cover of that. And, and uh, you know, the audience loves it when I switch in the second verse. Well, you know, even the Beatles did that, Come Give Me a Dine a Hand. Remember? They did yep. two German yep. songs on one of the albums. And so that's, that's always a good trick. But Tula Clark does that a lot too. She does them in all the different languages. So that's great. Well, listen, um, I want to yeah, thank okay. you. For coming by, uh, it was great to reminisce. I wish you a lot of luck on this tour, and uh, you won't be done sometime late fall, right? You're going to Europe first, and and then you're doing the tour here, and after that, plans are just open. Yeah, well, Europe. <clears throat> yeah, well, yeah. I mean, pretty much, you know, uh, Germany, uh, June fourteenth to July seventeenth, then, then. Um, the U.S. Uh, August fourth through September seventeenth, we'll do the Keswick again probably in November. Right. <clears throat> what? Uh, what? Are there any uh, festivals you're doing? I know you always you've done them in the past. Any festivals this year? In in Germany, yeah, yeah. There's one called the Black Sheep Festival, which is which yeah. is really really a lot of fun. Okay. All right. Well, listen. Give my regards to Rob and the rest of the guys. It was great, great catching up. Uh, wish you likewise. Luck. It was great to watch you from the beginning to now. It's been exciting. I've seen many, many shows over the years, and uh, like everybody else in Philly, big, big fan. But uh, you know, people know you all over the world now. So, thanks for doing this. I appreciate it. Thank you, Denny, and thanks for the Red Rocker story. That's great. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Good. No problem. That's Eric Bazilian of the Hooters discussing some highlights of his career. If you've never seen them live, I highly recommend it. It's always a real feel-good experience. Please tell your friends we're available on all usual platforms, wherever you get your podcasts, and we have a video version on YouTube as well. You can also sign up to our channel, and you'll be notified when a new episode is released. We put up some great rock and roll stories, and of course, it's free, no charge. The Rock Podcast is the number one podcast for classic rock, so... I thank you for listening. Find us at the website, therockpodcast.com, and we also have a Facebook page. You can send your comments, questions, suggestions, whatever, to me. I read everything. Hello at therockpodcast.com. Once again, the address to reach me, hello at therockpodcast.com. I read it all, and I love hearing from you. I'm Denny Somak, and that's it. 
for this episode.